Ever wondered why two speakers with the same price tag can sound so different? Or why your amp struggles with one pair but sings effortlessly with another? Welcome to the realm of speaker specifications, those cryptic numbers that most people politely ignore until they wish they hadn't. The truth is, speaker specs are not just for engineers. Understanding them, even just the basics, can mean the difference between a magical listening experience and a mismatch setup that leaves your music sounding flat, harsh, or just wrong. This video isn't about numbers for the sake of numbers. It's about giving you the tools to shop smarter. You don't need to be a techie. You just need a few decoder keys. So let's crack the code. But before we start, it is important to know that there is much more to speaker design than what I'm presenting. Each of these sections deserve dedicated videos, which I may do in the future, but in the interest of time and keeping this simple, I will touch on some of these important elements to empower you with enough to be a smart shopper. Number one, sensitivity. How loud is loud enough? Think of sensitivity as one of the elements of your speaker's efficiency. It tells you how loud the speaker gets with one watt of power measured from a meter away, typically something like 85 dB. Not very sensitive, may require more power, 88 to 90 dB. Average and fine for most systems, 92 dB and above, quite efficient and may work with low wattage amplifiers. Every 3 dB increase in sensitivity means your speaker needs half the power to play at the same volume. So all else being equal, a speaker rated at 90 dB will get just as loud with 50 watts as an 87 de decibel speaker does with 100 watts. That matters, especially if you're using a lower wattage amp. But here's the important caveat. Sensitivity alone isn't the entire story when it comes to efficiency, just one part of it. A speaker may be sensitive on paper, but still hard to drive if it presents a difficult electrical load, like low impedance dips or sharp phase angle swings. That's why two speakers with identical sensitivity ratings can behave very differently when connected to the same amplifier. To understand how speakers truly behave electrically, we need to go deeper. That leads us to impedance and phase angles, which reveal how much real world stress your amp faces when powering these speakers. So number two, impedance the amp and speaker's relationship, so to speak. Impedance is usually listed as four ohms, six ohms, eight ohms, and in some cases, 11, 12, or even 16 ohms. This number describes the electrical resistance the speaker offers to the amplifier. Lower impedance means the speaker draws more current. That's fine if your amp can handle it, but some amps, particularly entry-level amps or some older vintage models, might struggle and overheat. 8-ohm speakers are generally easy to drive and compatible with most amplifiers. 4-ohm speakers can sound great but require robust high current amplification. But here's where things get subtle. Impedance isn't fixed. The number on the spec sheet is a nominal value. It's an average. In reality, impedance varies with frequency. Some speakers dip below 4 ohms in certain parts of the audio band, especially in the bass region. This dip can demand a lot of current from your amp even if the speaker is rated at 8 ohms. So what you're really trying to understand is this. Does the speaker present an easy or difficult load to the amplifier? That's where phase angle comes in as the hidden curveball. So phase angle refers to the timing relationship between voltage and current. In a perfect theoretical world, 
current and voltage would flow in sync. But in the real world, the electrical components inside a speaker, like inductors, capacitors, etc., they cause delays. Voltage says go, but current lags behind. A zero degree phase angle is ideal. The speaker behaves predictably, like a resistive load. A large negative phase angle, like say minus 45 degrees, means current is delayed significantly, which forces your amp to deliver current at the wrong time, often under high stress. When this happens alongside a low impedance dip, say three ohms at 70 hertz and a minus 40 degree phase angle, you get a reactive load. This is much tougher for an amp to drive. The amp now has to work harder, stay stable under stress and deliver serious current at unpredictable moments. This is why some high sensitivity speakers can still be difficult partners for amps. They may seem efficient, but behave like electrical roller coasters. A real world example of contrast is Harbeth speakers. On paper, their sensitivity is very modest around 85 or 87 dB, which might suggest they need more power. But in practice, Harbeths are remarkably easy to drive to their full potential. Why? Because they have a stable 6 ohm nominal impedance with few extreme dips uh, and their phase angles are gentle, making them electrically predictable. The load they present to the amplifier is largely resistive, not reactive. That means even a high quality 25 to 50 watt amplifier can drive them beautifully. No amp meltdown, no struggle, just rich, coherent music. So while reactive loads can catch even strong amps off guard, resistive, well-behaved speakers like, say, the Harbeth, quietly demonstrate how system synergy is more than just numbers. It's about how those numbers interact. Let's talk about the next one, power handling. Now, this is not a horsepower contest. Power handling tells you how much wattage a speaker can safely accept from an amp, not how much it needs to sound best. RMS or continuous power is the steady power the speaker can handle long-term. Peak power is the short burst it can tolerate without damage. Most speaker damage happens from amps that are too small, not too powerful. When you push a weak amp too hard, it clips and sends nasty distorted signals to the speakers. So don't be necessarily afraid to pair a speaker rated at 100 watts RMS with 150 or 200 watt amp. That extra headroom is often a good thing as long as you're not reckless with the volume knob. Okay, frequency response and tolerance. Hearing the whole picture is important. This spec shows the range of sound a speaker can reproduce, typically something like 45 hertz to 20,000 hertz, plus or minus 3 dB. The lower the first number, the deeper the bass. The lower the minus, X dB number next to it, like for example, 45 Hertz minus six dB instead of minus three dB, the steeper the roll off. The higher the second number, the more extended the treble. It's important here to note that more bass isn't always better unless you have large acoustically treated rooms. Low bass can wreak havoc in small rooms. When a speaker produces deep, sub bass like 40 hertz and below it excites room modes standing waves that cause certain frequencies to build up and boom in some places and cancel out in others the result muddied bloated or even or uneven bass in untreated rooms especially small ones deep bass can do more harm than good without proper bass straps and acoustic treatment 
So while it's tempting to buy the speaker that has that hits 25 or 30 hertz, sometimes a tight controlled 50 hertz with no boom is more enjoyable and musical. Next up, crossover points or these are what I call hidden handshake. Most speakers don't rely on just one driver. They split the sound into parts, lows, mids, highs, and send them to different drivers, woofers, mid-range, tweeters. The device that makes this division is the crossover. A poor crossover can make music sound disjointed with weird gaps in mid-range or overly bright treble. A great crossover creates a seamless handoff between drivers so the speaker sounds like one coherent source. You might see crossover points listed in the specs like 2.5 kilohertz but unless you are deep into design this is more academic than actionable. Crossovers can be passive and active, and I hope to make a dedicated video with more info on this topic. But for now, let's do the next element, cabinet design. The speaker cabinet isn't just a container for the drivers, it's an active part of how a speaker behaves and sounds. Materials, thickness, internal bracing, damping, and shape all matter. Some brands aim for extremely inert cabinets using thick panels, heavy bracing to eliminate resonance. This can result in ultra clean, ultra high resolution sound, but sometimes with a touch of clinical sterility. Others like Spendor or Harbeth use thin walled resonant cabinets that breathe slightly like the body of a violin. This can yield a sound that feels more natural, flowing and emotionally engaging. Specs won't tell you this, but once you know to listen for it, you can choose the cabinet philosophy that fits your taste. Now, there are different types of speaker designs that use some sort of cabinet or structure like open baffles, dipoles, etc. Again, the subject is vast and definitely interesting. But coming back to speaker specs, Speaker specifications aren't lies if truthfully published by the OEM, but they aren't the whole truth either. It's basic information through which you begin to understand how a speaker will behave in your system and your room. But specs alone won't tell you how a speaker sounds at 2 a.m. and Bill Evans is breaking your heart with his piano playing or how it fills your room with warmth when Coltrane hits that note on Blue Train. Use specs to guide you, to trust your ears and to decide. Understanding speaker specs won't just let you help shop smarter, it will help you listen better. It turns the experience from random chance into intentional joy. If this subject interests you, I have videos you should watch about how room acoustics shape your sound, how to choose your amps wisely. Do check out links in the description as well for recommended audio gear. Hope to see you shortly in the next video.